Where should we start here, fellas? <laughs> We're lost at sea. Well, actually, the whole thing kind of came about. I had a girl working for me in Seward at the lodge, and so she was researching, and she asked me, like, oh, have you ever thought about surfing at Atu? And so as was kind of a spoof, I put it on the Instagram story. And I was like, has anybody ever thought of surfing here? And somebody was like, yeah, but I don't know how. And so I was like, all right, well, I put in a little bit of work. And originally, it was going to be two flights, like two private planes. And then I hit up Mike and I was like, Mike, you know, like, what do you think about this? Could you do this? Mike had kind of like, a, you know, an interest in it too and gave me a number. And, and that fell by the wayside, but the idea didn't. But then we were like, well, what if, what if we just did it with like normal people? Like, it doesn't have to be some big production. It doesn't have to be this elite thing. Came up with the idea, what if we break it down into um, segments, which would A, make it more affordable for people, B, it make the time frame for, for each group a little more reasonable. No one can just, we had pretty much figured out it'd take two and a half to three months to do that to do the whole thing. And uh, not too many people can take that much time off to go on a, what could be a wild goose chase, could be a story of a lifetime. And pretty much any place you stop to serve, with the, with the exception of a handful, will have never been served before. That's correct. For, fortunately, there's been a few enterprising folks that have gone up and dabbled with, with places here. And um, I think part of exploring, since mankind started exploring, where, where we try to build the block on top of the one that was laid down before us. In the 12 years you've been exploring this coast, how many new surf spots do you think you guys have found? Oh, I, if I put money on it, it was an over under, I'd put over 150. And I'd go home with the, with the purse. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, how many of those would you describe as high quality? What percentage of those would you say are high quality? I'd say it's kind of a bell curve. Um, you know, there's some that I've put with any wave that I've either been to or seen photographs or movies. There's been some that that um, we've really had to use our imagination to call them a surf break, but, <laughs> but we did catch waves and we rode them, so, so, so it qualifies. And then a, a whole bunch that have their days. You just found it, any crappy surf spot will get a really good day. And you know, what we don't know is, did we hit it on the really good day? Did we hit it on an average day? Right. Or, or where did we hit it? So we're, there's no one, there are no locals. Right, so we're, we're happy to, to hit them on any day that we can surf. But uh, there's def definitely world-class waves up here. When I first heard about the Milo through my friend Doc Meneker, and he, you know, told me that you have to go, I think like his exact words to me were, any day on the Milo is a good day. Truly, what spectacular landscape we were around. There were these one spot we anchored up, there were these twin waterfalls that were just gushing right into the ocean. Another place on Unak, there were wild horses, like a herd of about 30 of them. When you, when you go surfing in Alaska, it's about so, so much more than just the surf. And yet, sometimes you score a really good surf. We're on the motor vessel Milo. 
How much work did you have to do to convert it into a passenger boat? Kind of untold hours. There's been kind of a non-stop work in progress. My motto with the boat has been, we'd like to make each trip a little more comfortable than the trip before it. And you know this boat inside and out. You've welded big parts of it. You've rebuilt the engine. You know it pretty well. <laughs> It's kind of, kind of Wendy's and my kid. <laughs> they, they, kids always surprise you sometimes. <laughs> the boat is, is sort of a him personified. If, if you could anthropomorphize the boat, it's, it's exactly Mike. It's reliable. It's a little funky, it's unkempt, <laughs> you know, uh, but it will just go and go and go. He told me this, when he's out surfing, especially in winter, and it's getting dark, and it's cold, and he sees the Milo out there, it's like a cabin in the woods. Like he knows, he knows he's gonna go in there and be cozy. He just has to paddle to it and get to it. That's how I feel about it. Yeah, I feel like the Mile is a person, I really do. People ask me, why do you do so much cold water surfing? And um, it's not that I'm drawn to cold water, because I'm skinny and I get cold really fast. It's that I'm drawn to places where there's beautiful landscape and true unexplored wilderness and not a lot of people. And it just happens that in the surf world, those last places tend to be cold. What excited you most about this current trip to the end of the illusion? I think the newness and, and the challenge, the uh, logistical challenge, you know, fuel, water, groceries, people, time, speed, and distance weather, currents. And you like that stuff? You don't see it as like a, a headache or... A... Oh, the people. No. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think we're able to attract what we want to attract is people that are out here for the adventure. We all want to score waves and we will or we won't. But um, the, the, the thrill of the hunt the people to appreciate the effort that goes into that and, and willing to, to participate and help with that effort is pretty much ideal. And, and I feel for this whole voyage, that's the crew we've been able to assemble. I'm real, real happy about that. It's kind of a generic um, grassroots crew. This is like genuine like exploration. Like, and that's so different than just like, you know, 12 known surf spots and you're using your weather conditions to work between those spots. As everybody knows, surf is, is the reason we're out here, but not only is it like, yeah, there's a lot of really great things to see as far as geology and war history and wildlife, but it's also, there's a lot of just like general exploration of like seeing these different islands. You know, and you get to hang out. Like, like we're talking about like, you guys all become our friends because you've come back multiple Times and we get to hang out, we have a rapport, we know what it's like to surf and hang out. And that's really cool. That's, yeah, you can ask for more than that. The reason I jumped on it, this was an opportunity to really explore one of the last unexplored surf frontiers in the world. And this truly is. But I think the important thing to remember when you come up to Alaska as a surfer especially at board the Milo, is that if you get good surf, that's just sort of the icing on the cake, you know. And there's a chance you'll get really good surf, you know, there's a chance you'll get surf as good as any surf ship you've ever been on. But you don't always get that surf. But if you don't get good surf, you're not just sitting around some palapa in Mexico in the heat, drinking Coronas, bummed out about it, you know. You've got this incredible landscape to explore. And he's always, thinking in terms of activities. Like, okay, so we can't surf today, let's get on our subs and paddle to shore, we'll go beachcombing, maybe we'll find glass balls, maybe 
uh, when you do the Kenai Peninsula, a lot of times you go to shore and you paddle up these rivers for like a mile inland. And the, the sites you see there are just, no one sees. Like you go, you go to places that no one goes. This is the coolest thing. It's really cool to see Mike just like surfing as hard now as he was, you know, when I met him. And it's uh, something that's really motivational to think to myself that like, you know, I'm half Mike's age or even less than half Mike's age. But if I can be surfing in some capacity when I end up being his age, uh, I think that's a huge goal in life. Is there any one place on this trip that you're sort of most looking forward to? Um, probably Sand Point. That'd be the end of it. All the last <laughs> getting off the boat in Sand Point. No, um, no, I, I, you know, a lot, lot of it doesn't seem to matter how much research that a that, uh, person does. It, it, uh, you gotta be here to really see it. And so around every corner, yeah, you know, so far the weather's not what I expected. Um, and it, it might turn into what I expected, of just rain and wind and fog every day. Well, we've gotten a, probably wind every day, fog every day, but we've also gotten sunshine every day. We've gotten glassy conditions every day. I mean, every couple hours, it's totally different. You know, I've, I've thought a lot in my life about, in some ways, being, being a lifelong, really kind of obsessed surfer has limited my uh, travel experience in my life. For years, I almost refused to travel inland. If I was going to travel, if I had the time off work to travel, I was going to go someplace where I could ride waves. And I spent hardly any time in Europe or Asia, um, except on the fringes. <laughs> At the same time, I feel like surfing has taken me to a lot of beautiful places where a lot of people have been before like Hawaii and Tahiti some of the coast of Indonesia but it's the Alaska experiences where I realized that surfing has taken me to places a lot of places where truly nobody has ever been I, I know I've walked some beaches before that just a handful of humans have ever been on or paddled up rivers on a, on a paddleboard, and they're spectacular, just so pretty. Uh, and if, if, if I hadn't been a surfer, I never would have found that.